concern because the Europeans still had colonies in the Caribbean. But thankfully, we had Guantanamo and Puerto Rico. Those continue to be strategically important locations for us today, but certainly not in the same way, right? In the 1900s, it was about coaling stations for the fleet, and it was about creating this protective barrier for our soft underbelly. With security now assured, more or less, stronger U.S. Navy by far than during Monroe's era, what happens? Well, we begin to see the economic opportunity of Latin America and Teddy Roosevelt, who I showed you before on his mighty steed, says, I'm amending the Monroe Doctrine. Before we said separate spheres of influence. Now, if anything goes bad in this hemisphere and Europe, pay attention, if you want to invade and get your money back, there's a big scandal in Venezuela at this point, some things don't change. The United States will take care of it. And so here is Teddy Roosevelt uh, acting as the policeman of the Caribbean. The Roosevelt corollary is actually what we really are thinking about and talking about when we, uh, when we say the Monroe Doctrine, but we forget that. Where does it begin? Quiz. At the narrowest point, the Panama Canal, right? 1903, Ferdinand de Lesseps, he did a great job on Suez. Apparently it wasn't quite wide enough, but he did a great job. Failed miserably in Panama, almost bankrupts the French Republic, in swoops the United States. As you can see there, parking warships off of Colombia. The Panamanians declare themselves free of Colombia, independent in 1903. And 11 years later, we open up the canal to very little fanfare because it's on the eve of the United States entering the First World War. So we're not really getting a lot of credit for Panama, but you see a pattern, if you're visually oriented, there's, there's a decent graphic, of US intervention throughout the Caribbean, primarily over economic interests. Because during that time, companies like Dole and United Fruit had found these vast plantations where they could, for very little money, grow things that were profitable in the United States. Things like bananas, sugar, etc. So this era is a shift from get the Europeans out to what we call dollar diplomacy. This was about US profits at this point. Economic opportunity in it, and it made a lot of people very rich, and it kept some people very poor. Final chapter. Um, Latin Americans are very proud of the fact that the Rio Treaty predates NATO. And while it is true that then Secretary of State Powell was at an OAS meeting and invoked the Rio Treaty after 9-11, before NATO could convene, the Rio Treaty is something of a paper tiger. The Organization of American States, you read about all of these international organizations, important, but, and we'll get back to this, it becomes a hot zone, proxy wars. So some of this you'll hopefully remember, some of it you may not. Begins not in a place that we think about very often, but in Guatemala and a, a wonderful book by Schlesinger called uh, Bitter Fruit about the overthrow with the US support of democratically elected Jacobo Arbenz. But everything changes with the Cuban Revolution, 1959. By the way, that's what they were singing about in the intro video. Those are Cuban artists who live where? In the capital of Latin America, Miami some of whom have been canceled because they were perceived as being too close to the island's government. Literally, they got shows canceled. So whether this was speaking out for freedom of expression or whether it was manipulating their image, I'll let you decide. But their point 
was, it's been a long time, 1959. And while Che died in Bolivia and Fidel died some years ago, anybody know what's about to happen? What's about to happen? That's right. Raul Castro is going to step down this week as the head of the party. So they're saying enough already. Why was it central to the United States? Um, the Bay of Pigs didn't help. This was an embarrassment globally. The Cuban Missile Crisis, though, really marks when Latin America becomes of paramount strategic importance to the United States. The closest we've come to nuclear exchange, thankfully, it didn't happen. Khrushchev and Kennedy find a way out of this. But from then, the United States takes up the no more Cubas mantra, no more Cubas, right? And so you see, 89 Panama must kind of grayed out because that wasn't really about no more Cubas, but, uh, but it fit within the 1980s. You see a shift. And remember I said caudillos? So we're willing to support strong men if they're anti-communist. And if democracy suffers, so be it. And what does that look like? Well, here's the, the rogues gallery. So, things kind of get boring then, right? We have a return to democracy. Sure, there's some backsliding. You know, Venezuela, Nicaragua. But we have economic agreement. The hemisphere adopts free trade. You read a little bit about this. There's a commodities boom. All those materials I talked about that they're resource rich in, their prices go up. The middle class grows. Things are looking pretty rosy in Latin America. So, question number two. And it should be activated on the poll. How important is Latin America to U.S. security today? See if this will load. Nope. Well, that's inconvenient. This is the part of the technology. Oh, it's starting to load. But it's down the bottom. I don't get it. Ah. All right, I'm not going to be able to pull that up. All I can see is not very important, 17%. So, there we go. I can see it on my screen. Uh, about 33% say extremely important, about 50% say somewhat, and 17% say not very. But nobody says not important at all so far. I don't have a sample size here, but that's, that's handy to know. I'm going to have to flip back and forth between screens, apparently, and I apologize for that. All right, so let me bring you up to date. What's been going on? 8.4% of global population, nearly 28% of COVID deaths. That is horrific. And you're probably wondering why. I don't have, that's, by the way, uh, improvised graves in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they literally have got grave diggers working backhoes 24-7. One of the most urbanized areas in the world, more so than Africa, more so than Asia, about 80% of the population is urbanized. So if you have these ideas of Latin America as this sort of quaint rural place, think again. We're talking about massive cities, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, you fly over Sao Paulo for like half an hour before you land. It's crazy. So we know that urbanization leads to crowding, leads to passing the virus. Extreme inequality, one of the most unequal parts of the world. The rich are amongst the richest. Think about Carlos Slim, one of the richest men in the world. And now think about the people who are crowded into the slums of Sao Paulo. Massive, massive differences. And again, that's the legacy, as you read about, of those two original sins. 
huge informal sector. Now this varies from country to country, right? So in, uh, in Chile, which has a robust developing economy, a fairly small informal sector. Think about street vendors. Think about people who are working outside the taxation system. Piecemeal work in their homes. Chile, very small. Peru, massive. Bear that in mind when we start looking at some numbers here. Institutions don't work very well. And that is, I would argue, again, the result of the transition of democracy, strong men, weak institutions, strong individuals. If you're cash poor, where do you spend your money? Um, public health, along with education, has not been a big priority. So we're looking at about 80% of the population falls into this category of vulnerable. And of course, they have limited access to vaccines. COVAX is just starting to deliver. The Pan American Health Organization is working overtime, but not nearly enough to go around. Picture's worth a thousand words. Interesting, because you would think Peru, which has, of course, a large informal sector, I just said that, but they have a lower COVID rate per capita than Chile, the long skinny country <laughs> along the left side there. COVID is making advances everywhere, but let me tell you that it's right there. That's roughly the city of Manaus in Brazil, sort of the capital of Amazonia. That's where the P1 variant emerged. And I thought the headline in the Washington Post said it best, that Brazil is now the super spreader event of Latin America. You're seeing that variant picking up in places like Argentina and Chile. Brazil's healthcare system is not close to collapse. It is in the process of collapsing. Lack of oxygen, lack of hospital beds, lack of ICU space. Things are very, very grim. And so people want to point out Chile is, you know, the healthiest economy in Latin America. And yet they're suffering as badly as Brazil and worse than some other places. Now, disregard Venezuela up there because we know they're just not reporting the data. But it presents some sort of uh, dilemmas for us in making sense of the data. That tan part that's growing really fast in the middle, that's Brazil. And that's really worrisome. I won't throw the numbers out. You can read them, you know, 4,000 cases in a week. But in context, what does that mean? It means collapse of the healthcare system. And in terms of deaths, without access to good medical care, with the overcrowding, the underemployment, Latin America is suffering a public health crisis that it hasn't seen, um, I don't think ever. Not very good news. So let's look at the economics. Put this in global context here. The only country that really grew in 2020, uh, these are not in real terms, these are gross terms, was, was China. The United States suffered less, although we all know how much the United States has suffered, than many other places. And look at Latin America down there. A 7% contraction in a year. Some say close to 8%. This is as bad as the Great Depression. And that's not capturing all that informal sector. So it's probably much, much worse. Let me give you some sense of how it differs within the region. Now these are real gross domestic product, you know, adjusted for inflation. While it's overall 7%, look at how rough Mexico got hit. Why do I pull Mexico out? Well, because the International Monetary Fund doesn't follow my definition of Latin America, darn it. So I had to pull them out separately. And, and that's why that idea of cultural construct matters. So when you say South America and you mean Latin America, somebody's not understanding you. When you look at the data and you see Latin America, read the footnote. Does it include the Caribbean? 
how do you choose to cluster those places? So you've got the real GDP stuff, but look on the other side. Look at how consumer prices are going up in South America. So as income is going down, we already know it's unequally distributed. Income's going down, prices are going up. Just even more economic pressure. So where are we going to be? Forecast out to 2024. That's kind of hard to read. There's Latin America in the green. So emerging markets in Asia, excluding China, will be down 8%. Off 8% is not a phrase you want to hear from your broker. This is world macroeconomics, and I'm not an economist, as anybody who was in my RSS course can attest to. But negative 8%, off 8% is terrible. Off 6.8% ain't good either. Latin America is going to have one of the slowest recoveries globally. Heavy impact, prolonged recovery, not good. What's that going to do? You're going to see poverty go up. We have a generation that moved from poverty into middle class across Latin America from the commodities boom. They have slid back. So that income inequality is going to get even worse. And just when social services are necessary, you're going to see less tax revenue. And very few countries are able to spend counter-cyclically, spend more when the economy goes down. Why? Because they don't have the reserves. Peru is dipping into retirement funds, Social Security. Why? Because they're trying to help people get enough food to eat. And as a result, that debt is ballooning. That number astounded me. 57% of gross domestic product in Latin America goes to paying the interest on their debt. Think about that. If that was your financial status, you would be worried. They owe 80% of what they make. And that makes them even more reliant on the international financial system, right? World Bank, International Monetary Fund, Inter-American Development Bank, and their trading partners, primarily the United States and China. You see where that's going. All right, so certainly things have got to be better on the political front. Wrong. Anybody follow the news from yesterday? A couple of elections, right? Who won? Guillermo Lasso won in Ecuador, a conservative banker. So when you see possible pink tide, one country that was between the left and the right, tell me if this sounds familiar, decided to go with the conservative candidate yesterday. Meanwhile, in Peru, there was also an election. And who won in Peru? The headline today was nobody. Why? Because more people voted for nobody, either spoiled their ballot, remember, voting is mandatory in Peru, or voted without picking a candidate. Nobody would have won if, of course, you could just seize the presidency by having the most votes. But they're going to a runoff. And we don't know who yet, because there were, what, 18 candidates? So you see this fragmentation of the political sphere, because political parties are losing their popularity. Legislatures are now challenging the chief executive, not always very effectively, not always very fairly, but challenging. Let me give you a couple of uh, pictures to go with it. So, Jair Bolsonaro, president of Brazil, proudly calls himself the Trump of the tropics, has dismissed COVID, has fired four health ministers, if I'm not mistaken. The legislature probably would have impeached him if, uh, if it weren't so fragmented. And the hipster president of El Salvador, Bukele, I think he just turned 40, also just had his first kid. It's really nice, like you get your first presidency, first kid. So what did he do? He came in by creating his own party, just like Bolsonaro did. 
He ruled with no legislative support. And we'll see what he did about that in just a second. But in recent elections, he swept the legislature. Now here's the good news. He's brought crime down. He's kind of done okay with COVID and he isn't cozy with the Chinese. Here's the bad news, he's kind of an authoritarian. So how do we weigh those things as we move forward? Weak judiciaries. When I say massive corruption, the Odebrecht scandal, and this is like the Halliburton of Brazil, is the single largest bribery scandal in history. Not in Latin America, but in the world. $3.3 billion of confirmed bribes. They confessed to this. There's a lot more corruption than just this massive scandal, but that sort of serves a purpose. And if you have a weak judiciary, hmm, what are you going to do about it? It's, uh, it's a pretty difficult situation. Politicizing the military. So here's President Bolsonaro swearing in his new commanders just last week. Why? Well, because the old commanders quit because they said he was trying to politicize them. And he fired the minister, who they trusted to provide political distance, civilian control. The new minister is seen standing there, and his first proclamation said we should celebrate, you saw it very briefly in that history, the overthrowing of democracy by the military in the 1960s in Brazil. He said that should be a national holiday. So things are tough in Brazil. The commanders came out, the new commanders, and said in their very diplomatic terms that they're not going to be politicized. Sometimes easier said than done, as I think we all know. And I said we'd see it in a second. Here is President Bukele having a nice pleasant conversation with the legislature and his favorite battalion of infantry. He marched into Congress with a battalion of infantry. When I say that there's tensions between the legislatures and the executives, this is what I mean. When I say the military's been politicized, this is what I mean. Not that they're going to overthrow. We're not going back to military dictatorships. But that worries me. Popular protests, here you go. That's Chile in 2019. Largest protest since, uh, at least since President, uh, well, General Pinochet seized power. And, uh, and that's Ecuador. And in Ecuador, we call that Thursday. There's a protest every day of the week in Ecuador. Which is why it's so surprising that Ecuador chose a conservative president. Is there going to be a second pink wave? I don't know. The pink wave that you read about, right, where the hemisphere shifts left, how does it do that? Because this is the electoral cycle this year. That's pretty impressive. We call it a super cycle. And yet, the little yellow blotch up there chose to go conservative. I wouldn't have bet it. What do I mean social democrats, socialists, or leftist populists? I mean, do they just use the language of the left to tell people what they want to hear? Because remember, people are increasingly poor, out of work, suffering, their, you know, their health is at risk. Are they true socialists, you know, control of the means of production, or are they social democrats? You read very briefly about Lula da Silva in Brazil. Now, he was a lefty, but he was a social democrat. And you know what? The markets were terrified. You read about that. And then they're like, oh, not that much to really worry about. He's not going to nationalize industry. So be careful when you see these phrases like pink wave or rise of the left, um, because it disguises as much difference as anything else. And in the meantime, under all of these pressures, you had that reading by Nolte and Werner, all of these wonderful international organizations that have popped up and competing and trying to create the region, Brazil is withdrawing. Without Brazil, there is no regional integration. Brazil, I mean, just look at the size of Brazil. Also, look at the fact that it touches every country except for two, which helps explain a little bit of how it's the super spreader event. 
that's fraying, it's failing, perhaps we could eke out a small victory in the Pan American Health Organization. But with minimal money and minimal money, it's been a long time since there was a state on state war in Latin America. That was a very small conflict. It was an important conflict for those two countries, especially for the Ecuadorian Air Force, which, you know, likes to show you their victory trophies against their much bigger adversary, Peru. It was actually the lingering effects of something we talked about earlier, right? Fighting over borders. They fought over that in 1820. They fought over that in 1941. They fought over that in 1991. They fought over it in 1995. We think it's finally settled. Old school insurgents are largely not a concern. Um, old school insurgencies. So Plan Colombia, the multi-year, multi-billion dollar US investment in the Colombian armed forces and justice and, and other parts of their, their uh, government institutions led to, not exclusively, but contributed to a peace deal with the hemisphere's oldest insurgent organization, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC, in 2016. They turned in their weapons. This is, this is good news, right? Except not everybody turned in their weapons, and some took them up again. The National Liberation Army, also in Colombia, never stopped fighting, and we got some remnants of the Shining Path, their Maoist cousins down in Peru. So, I don't want to say this is all gone, but this is not the preoccupation that it was 20 years ago. The Venezuelan military is still operating, though, in part because they want uh, their protection money from the, uh, the ELN, drug money, which brings us to this question. If there are so few external threats, how is this possibly also the most violent region in the country? Or region of the world. I know, it sounds like it's all negative. I should have emphasized at the start, we also have the best music, the best food, and the best alcohol. So take that, Europe. If you're trying to think about terrorists versus guerrillas versus insurgents, let me suggest that those are sort of rooted in some old think which is you either do things for criminal purposes or political purposes. And what we've seen over the last 15 or so years in Latin America is that that doesn't explain things anymore. I'm going to offer you this term, criminal insurgencies. What does that mean? Well, it means they're really not trying to take over the national government, right? This is not like FARC trying to topple the government of Colombia. But they do want to control certain populations. So the Sinaloa cartel wants to control Sinaloa, right? The Medellin cartel wants to control Antioquia. But they don't just want to control there. They are flexible, right? So again, you may hear people's revolutionary as a preface or some similar sort of traditional leftist language. Don't be fooled, right? So here we have the FARC are trading drugs, the ELN are trading drugs, Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path down in Peru, is protecting. So you've seen a confluence of things, and it leads to this confusing typology of gangs, paramilitaries, cartels, Bakrim, TCOs, and, and everybody wants to come up with their own terminology. I'm not sure that that's helping us. I said they want to control Sinaloa, but they also want to control things across the border, right? These are entrepreneurs. They want to control the entire supply chain. They want to grow it. They want to refine it. They want to traffic it. They want to sell it. Why? Because you get more profit that way. Or they want to outsource it to somebody and take an ever-increasing percentage of the profit. So it's an international and a domestic problem and scholars like to call it intermestic. You can, you can ditch the, the jargon, but just know what it is. Just think the crossing of international and domestic. And guess what? They're having a great pandemic. They're growing. They're extending their control. They're trafficking in PPE. 
They're trafficking in oxygen. And they also traffic people, illegal hardwood, anything that makes a profit. But really, they're fueled by drugs. And as a result, they're incredibly well armed. Now, a lot of those weapons are coming from north of the border. Let me show you what it looks like. That looks like on the right, maybe a, a Ford F-350. And on the left, I can't really see. Those are up-armored, commercially bought with turret-mounted 50 caliber machine guns and the black one even has a turret, pretty nice. I'm going to try to show you a 60 second clip of what happened. That day in Mexico. Now I don't want you to think this is, nope, I have to move this over to there. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> For some reason, this will not embed, so bear with me. It is still a U I T, so bear with it. It's going to buffer. <laughs> Worked perfectly. And or it's not going to buffer. OK. I'll make sure that you get a copy of that so you can see it, because apparently um, the IT gods are not going to be happy with us today. But as the Mexican security forces tried to arrest the son of El Chapo Guzman, what happened? They. Uh, they received a counterattack from the Sinaloa cartel. They blocked all entrances to the city of Culiacan. Culiacan is not some rinky-dink little place. This is a large metropolitan area. They gave him a cell phone and said, call off the thugs. And you know what the Sinaloa cartel did? They rolled up to the military housing complex and they threatened to torch the place with spouses and children inside unless they let Oviedo Guzman free. And guess what the Mexican government did? They let Oviedo Guzman free. So what does that tell us? A, they've got tremendous tactical armament. 50 cal sniper rifles coming across the border from the US. When you hear like a, a car carrying the governor of fill in the blank province was hit. That's usually with an anti-tank round. I mean, this is, this is like combat. This is, this is not a guy in flip flops in the back of some little uh, some little Land Rover Jeep. This was a series of orchestrated, they exercised command control, operational art, and tactical you know, firepower like you couldn't believe. They called the Mexican government's bluff and won. What does that tell me? It tells me that the situation in Mexico is not really good. So let me ask you, question three. Now that I've given you this quick summary, what? You know, what should we do? Should we focus more? And I get it, right? This is not Iraq. This is not Iran. But should we focus more? Or do we have the balance about right? Or should we focus less on the region? This is the debate that is being had right now in the National Security Council. Very quickly. Let me tell you about the survey that the Perry Center, this is, you know, like you've heard of all the regional centers, conducted in 2019, 2020, um, just very briefly. And there are lots of problems with the survey because they only surveyed their graduates, who are probably pro-US. It was pre-pandemic, but still, 
it gives us an idea. So they said the fifth most problematic issue facing the region, weak government institutions. The fourth most, obviously there's some rounding going on here, poverty and inequality, followed by organized crime, drug trafficking, and number one, corruption. So if you're like me, you're probably thinking, awesome, now we can prioritize our efforts. Here's the problem. Let me encourage you to think about it a little differently. Use a systems approach. If I'm right and organized crime and drug trafficking are really part of the same bundle that we're dealing with in Latin America, well, you can't really deal with one without the other. Who's doing the drug trafficking? Organized crime, does that include insurgents? That's why I recommend we change our terminology. They're contributing to corruption. The corruption is weakening government institutions. That's fueling. Hey, the video worked. That is hilarious. And yet. On Thursday, October 17th, Mexican forces arrested the. There we go. Now it worked. <sighs> the poverty and inequality is fueling more foot soldiers for organized crime. Not in school, not at work. We call them the neither nors, the ninis. Former drug lord in Chapo. I swear I closed that. Online. There we go. So then there's the other feedback loop. All of that is contributing to weakening the government institutions. This is not a series of problems. This is a system of problems. So before you start ordering things from 1 to n, think about their interconnectivity. Let me visualize that for you. Everybody's seen this, you know, Jayad of South famous slide. Maritime and air routes. There we go. I don't, it's my magnetic personality. So discounting the fact that uh, there's very little air traffic, mostly coming out of Venezuela, by the way, avoiding Colombia so they don't get shot down, and then dropping stuff off the coast of Honduras. How can we think about this? Well, these are the go fast. Where do they depart? Where do they land? They're not going in and out of major ports. This is in and out of little places. We know that, you know, the guy who's driving is certainly on the payroll, but who's doing the loading and the unloading on either end? What institutions are present where they take off and where they land? I bet you there's not a big national police or military presence. Maybe there's a mayor. So who's being bribed? Is the mayor being bribed? And the population, who's looking the other way? Every single one of those points of departure and points of landing, there's a small act of corruption going on. I told you about Obdirect, that $3.3 billion. Here, think about hundreds or thousands of dollars and multiply it by each and every one of those go-fast trips. The region has a serious, serious corruption problem. So, what do they say was not a threat? I mean, pandemics, I get it. We probably would have failed on that quiz too. Um, but here are a couple of concerns for us, right? Great powers, China, where's China? China ain't there. Why might that be? Let me uh, try to take my Latin American counterpart's perspective. There are things that we can avoid, and there are things that we can't, right? Border conflicts, we can probably avoid those. China, China is already number one or number two trading partner of almost every country in the region. Don't put me in the middle, they beg us. Don't make me choose between China and you. That's an inevitable dilemma that they've got. But it's a long-term dilemma. And if you're facing an F-250 that's got a steel plate turret and a mounted 50 cal, I suspect that's your number one priority. Now, we were told that uh, in private, they will absolutely agree that this is a concern. But again, 
don't make me say it in public, please. These are senior defense leaders. Our threat is not necessarily their threat. What we are concerned about, what we see as a legitimate threat, and it hasn't been if you go way back to the Monroe Doctrine for a long time. Finally, what I like to call threats with benefits. Yes, China is putting too much money into my economy, they might say, but I don't see anybody else ponying up for it. And that presents us with an opportunity. Southcom's command strategy, what does it say? Weak governance. TCOs, there is a Mara for you. Violence and poverty. Illicit drugs and illegal migration. And the increased influence of China, Russia, and Iran. You don't get a lot of blackjacks in the hemisphere, but they have visited Venezuela. And Iran hasn't committed uh, state-sponsored act of terrorism like that uh, since mm, the 1990s. So really, we're down to China as the primary concern when it comes to great powers competition. China, China, China. So let's talk China. Uh, but first, I'd say for all of the, we're not on the same page that I picked up on, you could make the opposite argument. For those of you who are visually inclined, they map pretty closely. Again, with two exceptions. Illegal migration is not always seen as a concern by our Latin American counterparts. Why? Well, because they're sending remittances. So Honduras doesn't see people coming to the US and sending money back to them as a problem. Mexico may when they have to deal with Honduran migrants. So it's a yes and no. China, Russia, and Iran. So let's wrap up there. Um, it's too fuzzy to read, I know, but it gives you a sense that one belt, one road, you know, this hemisphere is not, obviously, um, exempt from this. Where would I be concerned about, if you ask me? Narrowest place in the hemisphere. And if you click through to one thing from your readings, look at the story of the Cococoro Dam. I know it's in Ecuador and it sounds like I'm only talking about Ecuador because I live there and my family there and all that, but no. It is probably the best example of how we can combat, at least in a narrative, Chinese investment. The dam can, on its best days, only work at 50% capacity. It's filled with silt. It is in the shadow of a volcano. Sometimes your environmental impact statement is a good idea, like when you've got a volcano right next to your dam. So how should we address this? I'd love to see. Oh, some of you already answered this. I will. We've got some options, and I'll end here. Um, first, China's not going anywhere, right? We read that China is still going to be at the center of our national security strategy once rewritten. But it looks like we're going to focus more on the roots, root causes, I should say, not R-O-U-T-E-S, root causes of illegal migration. Four billion dollars worth of attention. Here are some of the other options that we heard about. How do you fight corruption when the government itself is corrupt? The president of Honduras's brother was just convicted for drug trafficking. He is indicted. What do you do to combat corruption when it is the government itself that is corrupt? We take a hit every day in Latin America over Guantanamo. We only got 40 detainees left there. I'd ask if any other COCOM would like to take them. It would really help us in Southcom. Should we renormalize relations with Cuba? We take a hit for the blockade. The blockade came from, that's right, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But we trade. You can visit the Great Wall, but you can't visit the Malecon. Should we try and outlend or outinvest China? That's going to be difficult, especially given how slow the international system is and given how many strings 
outcome with it? Should we conduct vaccine diplomacy like China is? How do you strengthen government institutions, again, in this corrupt system? In the case of El Salvador, how much authoritarianism is too much? If he's beating COVID and beating the gangs, is that okay? How are we going to cut down on the firearms? And I'm not just talking about like nine mils. I'm, again, talking about 50 cal sniper rifles, 50 cal automatic crew serve weapons that are flowing into Mexico. And will we ever face the demand? So there we go. I'm sorry I'm a minute and 38 seconds over, but I was close. I come from Latin America. We're not really big on time. So that's what I've got. As you can see, more questions than answers, but I'll try and answer your questions if I can. And if not, I can at least give you an informed opinion about it. Go ahead in the back. Good morning. Thank you for our presentation. I'm a Coronel Marcos from Brazil. The big problem now in Latin America that you tell to us. And my question is, you, you show to us that uh, corruption is the first problem that the, uh, on, on Latin America. In, in your view, what the, the president of the country need to do to attack this? Is, 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 is that that will be the, the first goal to, to active on, on, on his go government? Well, let me take, again, the two cases that I, I put up. In the case of El Salvador, I think Fighting corruption would look like the president submitting to Congress, which he now controls, his independent commission on fighting corruption, modeled on the one that was in Guatemala that the Guatemalan president expelled because they got a little too close to him and his family. In the case of Brazil, I think it is more complicated because there is no proposal for a an independent commission. To Brazil's credit, uh, there, there has been the hemispheres, the world's largest corruption scandal, and Brazilian authorities brought it to light. I think the example of El Salvador is encouraging, but I think corruption works across a whole bunch of different spheres. So I would start with, with that example. I would then move to a more sub-regional proposal in the case of Central America where Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, if not officially, then civil society under the auspices perhaps of the Organization of American States is working to foster transparency. One of my big concerns about the hemisphere is how the law has been weaponized. So how a, a president can be impeached for reasons that have very little to do with breaking the law. We saw this in Brazil. We saw this in Peru. We would have seen it probably more recently if, uh, if some things hadn't happened. So, there's not one thing that can be done, but I would agree with you that if the chief executive is not setting the tone, starting the process, it's going to be that much more difficult. And this is why I'm so interested in President Bukele, because while he has authoritarian tendencies, he has said he supports transparency, as opposed to Honduras, where again, the president's brother just got locked up, and the president himself has been accused. Guatemala, that kicked out CICIG. So you have, you have possibilities there. And I think we have to, quite frankly, apply more of a, uh, a counterinsurgency mindset of starting with an inkblot and growing out. Because we can't patrol every single one of those small beaches 
where those go fast boats come and leave from. The United States can't do it. We might be able to track them, but we can't stop them. And certainly Latin Americans can't. So we have a big task ahead. And uh, my last thought is, I'm not so sure that is a task for the military. So the next question is from online, uh, from Lieutenant Colonel Donnelly, Seminar 5. Given the history of the origins of many nations in Latin America, and the consistently ungoverned and undergoverned spaces, coupled with their problematic history in the region, when will it be, become more useful to discuss many of these countries and their problems as failed states? So I would say we have actually introduced the concept of failed state to Latin America. Um, during the Pastrana administration in Colombia, President Pastrana thought that if he ceded an area roughly the size of Rhode Island to the FARC in the sort of southeast part of Colombia, that that would be an act of goodwill and that the FARC would come to the table. This is now back in the, the mid to late 1990s. It'll come as a shock to you that what the FARC did was they pulled back into the DMZ, they refitted, they rested, they recruited, and then they reattacked. That was when we started talking about Colombia as on its way to being a failed state. What stopped that? It really depends on where you come down on these issues. I do believe that Plan Colombia together, which Pastrana, for, you know, took his credit, set the stage for, negotiated with President Clinton, that that was important. It was, however, executed under President Uribe. And here again, we fall into this dilemma. Uribe is a hard, hard liner. Mano dura, the, the hard hand. So the good news is Colombia did not become a failed state. The bad news is we're now looking in hindsight at scandals like the false positives where peasants who had no affiliation with insurgent groups were presented as insurgents who had been killed in action. This is a huge scandal in Colombia. And it's been fairly well documented. And it's, it's very, very worrisome. How much do we weigh human rights? You, you, why are human rights so important? Because of that litany of authoritarian leaders, many of whom, most of whom, all of whom, the United States supported, and the violations of human rights. So now if you go into Southcom down to the theater, you got to do the darn human rights. Anybody gone through that wonderful training? I'm not sure it's really addressing the problem, but most CBTs don't. But we have some sort of mandatory training. We have a human rights office in U.S. Southern Command. Human rights is part of the curriculum at WINSEC at the Perry Center. Human rights is part of what we tried to bring to the hemisphere after the return to democracy. But we're constantly being put in this difficult situation. Whatever we perceive as the threat, how much authoritarianism are we willing to tolerate? I have no idea why it's doing that. Um, while they attack that. But I don't think there's a good case for being a failed state in most places um, in Latin America. But we have introduced the concept before and addressed it. So Mexico, I worry deeply about Mexico, but I don't think it's failed because the central government is absolutely still functioning in Mexico City. Why? Because the Sinaloa cartel doesn't want to take over the presidency. They just want to keep you the hell out of Sinaloa if you're a national police or military. Any questions from the audience? Come on. Hey, sir, I've got a question for you. Shoot, where are you? There you are. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gunner, Seminar 2. So my question is, the, it seems like the South American drug cartels, just the sheer amount of profit that they get from 
transporting drugs and the means that they do it across our borders with s submersible submarines. It's just a drop, like whatever we provide is a drop in the bucket to counter how much they have and the incentive on their side to do it. What, what, what is your recommendation <laughs> <laughs> for yeah. the U.S.? Because you mentioned not, not making it a military problem, which it has traditionally been you know, with, with some joint agency, but w what is your recommendation to really prevent that? Would it be well, economic sa sanctions with finances, et cetera? So, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on this, I, I never said it wasn't a military concern for them, and I, I didn't mean to say that. Um, we, first, we have to recognize that while the United States military swears an oath against all enemies, foreign and domestic, we tend to focus on the foreign part. If you are in, again, we'll stick with Colombia as a convenient example, you're probably more concerned about the domestic part. Although you do have Venezuela next door, but you know, they can't even fly most of their planes, so you're not too, too worried if you're the Venezuelan Air Force. I think the most interesting part of how we have responded to that is, as you suggested, looking at it not solely as a military, but as an interagency problem. So looking at Navy ships that go under Coast Guard command in order to execute law enforcement functions, that sort of flexibility and adaptability, could we massify that? Possibly. I, I, don't know that we have the resources, and they're certainly not organic to U.S. Southern Command, so it would have to be searched from other places. But on their side, um, I think there's something interesting going on as well, and that is not just military support to police, which can occasionally go well, oftentimes goes very poorly, but the international collaboration. So when you see Belize, Guatemala and Honduras start to collaborate, that's unusual, and yet it has been happening. So I think it's rebuilding some of those international organizations and networks. If they don't exist at the state level, keeping them alive at the military to military level, and those networks absolutely exist. Um, it's. It's not a problem with an easy fix because as you suggest, you state, they've got the perfect product. It nearly sells itself. And if you can get it over to Europe, you're gonna get about five times the profit as you would get by bringing it to the US. So they've got an expanding market. I am very cautious about legalization arguments. Um, I think there's a stronger argument to be made for marijuana than for cocaine, just to state the obvious. Um, so if we're going to legalize marijuana at this point, that was how a lot of the Mexican cartels got started. At this point, you know, that's like a side hustle for them. So it's pennies on the, the, on the dollar for them. I wish I had an easy answer for you. If I did, I'd probably be on the National Security Council, not on the, the stage here. But there are no easy answers, and that's the dilemma. These are systems problems that you can look at, remember, weak state institutions. That didn't start with the last administration or the Reagan administration. That started with colonization and independence. So the problems are longstanding. Drugs just pour rocket fuel on the fire. And I wish I had a more optimistic note to end my answer on. <laughs> um, thank you very much. This is um, uh, all we have time for today. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation, uh, Dr. Stromaski. And uh, oh, you can't see it, but when you get the slides, my email is on there. You can drop me a line if you have any questions that you didn't want to bring up here. So, right, we'll we'll do, we'll do that. We'll send out the slides as well. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And have a good seminar, everybody.